Welcome to In the Belly of the Beast. For the last two months, we've been basically on hiatus playing old episodes because the studio has been closed. The studio just opened up again. I, this is one of the first shows that they've done You're live in the studio again. And my guest today is Frank Licato, uh the artistic director of uh, Hudson Theater Works. And he is remote, at which we will be now for probably at least another month. And even though I'm sitting in a room that's 40 feet by 60 feet by myself, the mandate is I wear a mask. So I have to wear a mask. Fortunately for Frank, he does not. He's, I believe, in his own office. Welcome, Frank. Hi, hey, Paul. How are you? I'm good. I've known Frank off and on for well, over 40 years. In fact, yeah. one, of the, one of the reasons why I actually became a practitioner <laughs> in theater as opposed to just a critic, which is what I was when I first met Frank, is I saw Frank do uh, Diary of a Madman with Cambridge Ensemble. And it was as close to a near perfect production, certainly of a one man show as I've ever seen, Frank. That oh, was well, thank you, Paul. That was excellent. Um, I saw that in a church in Harvard Square. I can't remember what the name of the church was. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't either. <laughs> I don't either, but it was, um... It's part of uh, what was going on in Cambridge at the time, actually in Boston at the time, as you know, because you ran one of those theaters. Um, that was there were so many Green's small theater, theaters. Right? Yeah, yeah. Joanne Green, who who wrote, um, I think the ninety eight percent something in theater. Her handbook, I think. Handbook. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Joanne she was uh, she was very uh, uh, instrumental in, in in the birth of those small theaters. In, in that area, especially yeah. in the especially in the seventies. I mean, Boston went through many different uh, incarnations. My theater opened in seventy nine, and it was a theater of the eighties. But uh, the theater of the seventies, the three that I think of that I that I look at as um, the most powerful theaters in Boston in the seventies were, ironically, Boston Arts Group, um, which ran, uh, I believe, uh, it was right off of the park. Uh, and they ended up existing until I think they lost their lease. Uh, Joanne Green's uh, Cambridge Ensemble, which I think did most of their shows in that church. Is that right? Um, but we did all the shows in that church. Yeah. All the shows yeah. in the church and reality theater. Uh, those, are right. the those are the three theaters that that I saw as kind of touch tones of that period of time. Um, yeah, there was one other named the Caravan Theater. I oh, think, right. Caravan which is, Theater. Which is all there were a bunch of other theaters. There was, I think, yeah. Bo Jess was around already. Um, but those are the theaters that influenced me anyway. Uh, and then in the me 80s too. in Boston, I started my theater in 79. There was um, uh, the new Ehrlich Theater, which became the new rep or something. There was always the Lyric Stage. Um, Lyric Stage, right. Uh, but, but the Lyric Stage did virtually well-known classics. They did a lot of Oscar Wilde. They did uh, Child's Christmas in Wales every Christmas. Joanne had a tendency of picking shows that were uh, off of the beaten path, I think. Yeah, she very much did. Um, I met her, I mean, I, you know, I was in this, when I, I went to Emerson College, so I was in Boston at the time, and um, I wound up working, there was also this other company, which was very Grotowski-like, uh, they were called Stage One, oh, I and they were that. run by a gentleman named Khalil Sakakini. I remember um, Khalil Sakakini too. Right, right, and uh, yeah, I know, quite a name. And and um, it was very Grotowski, and it was almost uh, the monk. You know, it had that sort of religious air to acting. You know, uh, the actors were. We, we did a lot of physical work, and the plays were created from scratch. So that's that's where I started uh, working in in Boston. Um, I had I left Emerson at that point because I was starting to get work, and then um, I don't know if you remember Maxine Klein. She was a teacher Klein, at Boston, of course. right? Of so course. she was she wrote a play called Tanya about the revolutionary. Uh, che Guevara's, she also did working uh, forever. Yes, yes, and. Um, so I got cast in that, and um, uh, you know, not a big part, but I, I, I met Joanne. It was done at Joanne's church, at the Cambridge Ensemble Church. And after that production, Joanne came up to me and asked me uh, if I would wanted to work with her, and she asked me to do Death Watch, uh, the Genet play. 
and um, changed my life. Uh, you know, uh, not just the play, but also working with Joanne. She was, um, she loved actors. She gave me a lot of confidence as a young actor. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I feel very lucky in a way that, uh, y y that I'm sure you'll, you'll uh, agree with this, Paul. You know, it, it wasn't all like Meisner or Strasberg, you know, we, the idea of the physical gesture as a way to get to something emotional was just as valid. And um, well, at the Joanne Kennedy was Ensemble, rock was... solid intellectual as a yes. human being she was. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I can see, I, I never worked with her because I'm not an actor. Um, although she did uh, direct at my theater in New York. Um, uh -huh. But Joanne, if you ask Joanne, any question about what she was doing, she had a, a, a litany of an answer. You know, she really thought out everything that was going through her productions. Yeah, she was extremely smart. Um, and, and for, you know, for uh, me, uh, she, she was, you know, she was very generous, you know, just gave me a lot of confidence and uh, allowed me to uh, uh, just take chances, like huge chances, and um, uh, was very, um, supportive of those chances. So, uh, you know, we did a lot of work together in those years. Um, and, well, you're uh, a force you know, on the stage. You're not, you're not a small character on the stage. You, you really jump out at an audience. Um, oh, well, thank you, I guess. <laughs> no, it's a, it, it's a hell of a compliment. You know? uh, well, thank you. I mean, um, you know, there's, there's actors who have this kind of rapport with an audience, and there's great actors who don't necessarily have that rapport. You know, right. you're definitely an actor that audiences connected directly with. It would be hard to take my eyes off of you on stage. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I loved acting. You know, I mean, I, I, I ha you know, I'd love to do it. I, I do it a lot, lot less frequently now. But um, but I did just do two shows. I did. Uh, I, I played. Um, uh, we did The Caretaker. And obviously I, I played the older gentleman. <laughs> and um, I just did. Uh, 12 Angry Men not too long ago, um, which was uh, a, a lot of fun. It was with a bunch of uh, artistic directors from New Jersey were in it. Um, so it, it made it kind of fun to do. But I, I don't act that much anymore. Um, Are you primarily was, a you know, director at the theater now? Um, sorry, Paul. Are you was primarily that? a director at your own theater? Yeah, that's what that's what started. Which you know, is too I, bad. I, I, um, I, I, I sent Frank a script specifically for him to be an actor in so i have no idea whether he's even interested in it but but well, it's, I, I, it's definitely a piece, it, yes i am <laughs> it's definitely a piece that i see you in well Actually, I'll, it, I'll, I'll look at it that way that's great i hadn't thought of that but thank you i'll look at it that way now if we could um, if we could go now you left boston for originally for los angeles is that right well, what happened was we did that. We brought Death Watch to New York, as you know, and it was a big hit. Uh, you know, I, I, it was uh, uh, show you the precarious nature of theater. We were originally at the new where the New York Theater Workshop is now on East Fourth Street, and um, uh, it, the play was good. You know, it had been it was a big hit in Boston, uh, and um, it was the nature of the space didn't suit the production. You know, as you know, in the church we were on the floor, and the audience was sort of raised and. It was an intimate quality to it. But um, when we got to this, the New York Theater Workshop space, it had that raised stage at that point. And people weren't enjoying it, and we knew that. And we were only doing a week of previews. And one of the other actors in the piece, uh, Paul D'Amato, ran into a friend of his who ran this theater right next door. And luckily, that was available. So we said goodbye to New York Theater Workshop and packed all our stuff and moved next door. And the play took off. It was a big hit. And, you know, you, you learn things as you go along and you realize how important space can be to uh, anything that you're doing. Um, so that was a big hit. And uh, we came back to Boston after that. And I continued to work at the Cambridge Ensemble. You know, we did Gulliver's Travels. I did a play called Judgment uh, by a gentleman named Barry Collins, which was uh, an 81 page monologue, um, which uh, was hell to learn. Um, and uh, uh, so, so I, after that, I decided to uh, decided to go out to Los Angeles and see if I, you know, what it was like. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I got I 
I didn't particularly like living in Los Angeles, <laughs> although, uh, you know, I would get work. You'd get episodic stuff in TV and things like that. But I didn't really like I didn't like the fact that you, you, you couldn't walk down the street and see people or meet people or run into people, which I love doing in New York. You know, you'll run into people, you know, all the time or that you could stop. Well, nobody walks I, in L.A. anyway, right? Right. Nobody. No. And, nobody. and the, 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 to me, the biggest problem in Los Angeles, and I spent a fair amount of time there in the 80s myself is that people are doing theater in Los Angeles to get film and television work. That's exactly the, right. That's the desire in a show. It's like, what you know, how will it expose me to that? Whereas yeah. in New York, you're hoping the show goes, you know, will 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 have legs and go somewhere. You know? Yeah, and I think I think in New York, you know, the the, the audience for uh, plays in Los Angeles is mainly other actors. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, you can if you can get casting directors world. down there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, in New York, you, you, you're getting all sorts of people. And uh, it's it's just, you know, it's intellectually more exciting. And uh, uh, just, true. you know, the energy of New York and the, and, the, and the people, you know, you run into writers, directors, filmmakers, uh, what have you, uh, visual artists. So there's there's a, a, a wonderful melting pot in New York of artists. And I think we feed off each connected other. connected in New York, right? Like I work with yeah. people... Like I worked with somebody last year that I worked with in 1990 as well, you know, wow. which which you don't see so much in other places. Like you mentioned, Paul Damato, uh, he right. lives he lives in New York I, I still, I believe. He is a Facebook friend of mine. He actually, I think he now, I mean, he he still comes to New York, but he lives in Worcester, I think, actually. Worcester, Mass. Um, yeah, I believe so. I believe he bought a house there. Oh, uh, really? Have you worked yeah. with him? Have you worked with him lately? I not lately. No, no. Paul sort of decided uh, from what I can gather that uh, he 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 wasn't that interested in pursuing it any longer. Um, so he, he sort of, ha you know, left the business, really. Um, we started we did a we were attempting to do a few things together, but it just never, never worked out. It's too bad. He was a he was a wonderful uh, actor to work with. We had a great communication between us. So it was a lot of fun. But Paul also. You know, he started to get movie work pretty early on after Death Watch, and uh, that was taking him other places as well. So, um, it's funny how that happens too. Uh, the, I think the best actor that I ever worked with in New York is a guy named Michael Santoro, who is now a doctor uh -huh. in New York. You know, and he played. He was my Pokey in my production of Pokey off Broadway. And uh, okay, and uh, uh, you know, you know, he's been on the front lines during the pandemic. And more power to him, and he's a great, great man. But I miss him on stage, and, right. and it's it's when you get to be our age, and you look back, and it's like the people that are still doing it are like more few and far between than what they had been before. And I oh, often that's absolutely kind of, the truth. I often kind yeah. of like marvel at the people who actually stayed in the business as opposed to the ones that didn't, because it wasn't uh, all me it, too. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. always necessarily from talent or observation or whatnot it was i think more like a desire of what they wanted to get out of life well you know it's funny i was at a uh a, a, a replay reading at, at labyrinth uh you know which used to be uh, philip seymour hoffman's theater and um somebody came up to me and asked me what i was doing this is before the pandemic and i said uh well you know i'm still doing stuff i have a project i'm working on blah 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 and um and uh, she she said, well, you know, uh, uh, that, well, so I responded. I just said, well, I, I, I can't help myself. And she said that's I thought she gave me a great answer, made me feel good in a way, because I have certainly spent my life hoping this was the truth that um, she said, uh, well, that's that's how an artist responds is you can't help yourself. It's true. And it's a simple yeah. line. And it's true. It's like, yeah, if, if you if you can't imagine doing anything but what you're doing continue doing it you know that's it and you figure it out you know i mean you you you, you figure it out as you go along some uh, this younger director asked me how do you how do you do how do you continue to do what you're doing and i just said you figure it out you know you take jobs you do what you have to do and uh, as you get older you still do the same kinds of things you know luckily i haven't had to do that in a while but but uh, but that's what you do you know you're always looking for that you know when um, i when i moved to canada when I was moving to Canada, I moved there to get married to a, a, a chair of a department at a university that was tenured in Canada. What, what university was that? Carleton University. Uh-huh. Um, 
And when I told Israel Horovitz that I was making this move, he said to me, well, you know your career's basically going to be over, right? Because I'd been working in New York really for 20 years at that point. And, uh, and I know what he meant. And I also know it's not tr knew it wasn't true. Right. Because what I was doing really didn't matter if I was going to get 300 people on Theater Row or if I was going to do it in front of 50 people in Ottawa, you know, because right. what I did, I did not for, not for the size of the house, you know, not ultimately for how much I was going to make from it, you know, and that's been something, I mean, I live in Portland now, which is 100,000 right. people, and I do nothing but original works here, which is not the, uh, the, the, it's not par for, for what Portland does. <laughs> Right. No, it's hard to do that kind of uh, thing. But it is incredibly rewarding, uh, and it has been my entire life. And I look at what you do, and I think um, you're also you're living kind of the extension of what my life, I imagine my life is, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, um, one reason I, I came to New Jersey to, I mean, I moved to New Jersey when my son was born. So, um, but I, I thought... I could have gone, you know, I could have kept doing showcases in New York or things of that nature. And I, um, what, what eventually happened was, you know, you, I, when I was younger, I got together with a bunch of friends. And one of the actresses said to me, you know, you should be a director. So I had never occurred to me before. It was a, we were doing a Sam Shepard play. And, um, and, and so uh, I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. So um, I directed action and uh, was in the play Killer's Head at the time. And I really liked directing. I, it was the first time that um, I, that my ideas mattered. You know, it wasn't just uh, my emotional response to things that I was searching for. The the ideas I had about the play and the people in it, and uh, it, it, the play in the context of the time that we were doing it, um, it, it excited me. You know, the, all all of that. And um, so. I started, I started to direct and, uh, you know, a lot like acting. I didn't get jobs right away, but we certainly were doing showcases and stuff. We did a number of them. Um, and and um, then I, I started to get work in New Jersey, of all places. Once I moved here, um, people started to offer me directing jobs and, and uh, it was great. You know, some some good theaters. But I, I got um, I, you know, a lot of times you're jobbing in, as you know. So I was doing some plays I wasn't particularly fond of or, you know, some I was, you know, but uh, a lot of them I wasn't. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be able to do the plays as I got older. I wanted to be able to do some of the stuff that uh, interested me. Um, so I thought I would start my own theater so I could do that. And um, and, and that's what Hudson Theater Works has become, you know, um, a, a place for me to to. Uh, wrestle with the authors and the ideas that these people uh, uh, give to me and also uh, to do new plays. I try to do one new play a year. Um, uh, I, I don't try. We do. We do one new play a year, Well, I mean, which is, yeah. It's a collaborative art form, right? And everybody has their job within that art form. But I look at it as a playwright has, uh, it has to visualize a concept. A director has a vision of that concept, and an actor is the character is is the artist that gives that concept a three a third dimension. You right. know? And if everybody's doing their job, and each of the each of the players are allowing the other artists to do their job within the project, then you have something. You know. Yeah, I think you're I think you're absolutely right, and um, and also I you know I realized too that I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. An, uh, it, I was an interpretive artist. That's that's what my strength was. Even as an actor, um, is finding some way to interpret what was given to me. Uh, you know, playwrights create the work, but that's not what I was uh, particularly good at. Um, I think I wrote two plays in my life. You know, and uh, I, they're. I don't have them any longer, and I don't care. Um, but I I love working with playwrights. You know, I love the idea of. Uh, well, like you said, the, the, I, I love the discussions. That's what I miss most about live theater. You know, we're in the Zooming period, which is really sort of intolerable. It's the best we have. 
but um, uh, I miss uh, I miss being in a room with a group of people and and haggling over the idea of a moment and what that moment might mean and and what the actor is doing with that moment right. and you know I really miss that I miss that terribly so um, I'm really looking forward to getting back Zoom into the room. Zoom doesn't really allow for much collaboration. I mean, basically, no. you're, people are doing what they're doing within the project, and that's it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I agree with you. I miss I miss the kind of a intellectual social interaction between artists. You know, uh, that's that's something yeah. we if we don't get back to, I'm just going to shrivel up. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think I will too. I mean, I'm I'm feeling the need. That's why I'm I'm more positive about September than maybe I ought to be. But I I I, I feel the the need to do it again is is right. very strong, very profound for me right now. Um, well, now and, you brought uh, up the pandemic and what's happened yeah. to theater. What have you been doing during this pandemic and what's your theater been doing? Well, we, you know, at first I would watch some Zoom stuff and I would just think, not knowing how long this was actually going to last. And I, I, I thought, you know, I, I, that stuff just so seems so flat to me and so uninteresting. And I was looking at some really good people, you know, um, uh, and I, before that, I had seen stuff that the National Theater had done, you know, where they have 20 cameras or whatever. And uh, that's fine. Uh, that That's sort of interesting. Even though it's not live, it still gives you a feeling of what that might be. But uh, we certainly can't afford to do that. So, and I didn't want to just do Zoom sessions. We, we, we belong to the New Jersey Theater Alliance. And um, they have something called the Stages Festival every year. So, when the pandemic hit, we were right in the point where we were doing readings of new plays, which is what we do once a year called Playworks. And I was casting a play called Bunnies, which uh, the author uh, used to be a Playboy Bunny, and she wrote this play based on her experiences in 1973 at the at the Playboy Club. And um, it, it 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 has uh, very much has overtones of Me Too, and you know it was very timely. So we we're in the middle of casting that when when all this hit, and we had just closed Hamlet which uh, for us was a big success. And uh, we did our first children's show, which was, you know, sold out. It was great. So it couldn't have come at a worse time in a way. Um, so uh, what we decided to do, I, I had this idea of doing, I, I didn't want to do Zoom sessions. So what I thought I would do is I'd ask my playwright friends, uh, and I'm, I'm probably going to ask you, um, to just write me five-minute plays. And, um, and then I would give those plays to an actor and the actor would shoot them on their phone or camera or iPad, whatever they had. Um, so basically the, monologues, is that what you're looking at? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless uh, we didn't do any with couples. I tried to get a few couples to do something, but uh, it wasn't, uh, it just wasn't in the cards. So yeah, they're like five minute monologues or less. But, you know, I was able to reach out to people I know, like, you know, John Shanley and, and Neil LeBute and Richie Vettieri and... Uh, uh, you know, a, a number of other people who, uh, Jack Canfora, I don't know if you know some of these people, but they're all really, you know, talented playwrights and stuff. And they were all extremely generous and uh, and gave me a, uh, these short monologues and I would give them to people to do. Um, and uh, it, it turned out it was great. You know, we released one a How week. How many did you do? I think we did about 30, actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, were you like and, pumping you know, them out the, once a week? Is that, and were you sending them to your like clientele or? Uh, well, I was sending them. We just we would put them on YouTube. Is where they were. Um, we put them on our YouTube channel, uh, and they were free. I mean, we didn't we weren't trying to raise any. You know, we'd ask for donations if people wanted to, but uh, we we weren't charging any money for the broadcast itself and uh some of them are quite remarkable a lot of them you know i would give them to actors i knew we have an in-house company here called the forge uh which uh we we meet virtually once a month and playwrights bring work in and actors bring work in and stuff like that um so a lot of the actors are from were from that um but also they were you know other people i knew from outside of that group who uh i've known for a while and if i thought the monologue was right for them i would pass it on to them so um, so we started doing that, and that was uh, that was great. You know, people really responded. Our audience really grew. So, um, if people wanted to watch these, how would they do that? Um, they would just go to YouTube and and type in Hudson Theater Works, and uh, they would be able to see all of them. They're all there. Uh, so just pull the first plug in on YouTube Hudson Theater Works, and they would pop up. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's theater with an R E. 
um, it would take you to our, you know, our, our channel. Uh, and um, it's, it's, uh, there's some other things on there, but it's a virtual festival, it's called. So all the monologues are there. Um, you know, we were, uh, like I said, we were very lucky to get uh, some really good, well-known, good playwrights to write stuff for us. Um, so there was that. And at some point, you know, we're still doing it, although we're not doing it every Wednesday like we used to. Um, if people have something they're interested in having done, uh, having us do, we'd love to have them submit something. So it's much more infrequent now, but, um, but we're still doing it. And then I got, to, I was watching, uh, Irish rep does these plays on, on it, they, outside of actually filming a production like the national does or, right. um, the, or the Mint theater also films their production. So they're releasing those, which is great. But, um, the, uh, the Irish rep, what they do is, is um, they send, they send an actor a camera and the actor films their part. And then they edit all these parts together with these zoom backgrounds. Um, yeah, it's pretty expensive. I don't, I don't think we could afford to do that necessarily, but I had an idea. I thought that was really interesting. And I thought that, well, I had just gotten this musical called Elliot and me from someone who uh, wanted to uh, produce it. And I said, well, look, I don't know. You know, I was going to do it as a reading uh, when the theater shut down. And I said, but I had the idea that it's only a two-person musical. Um, if you want to produce it as a, a, a filmed play, uh, I could try and do that. So you we tried did to get like a, an, uh, acting, uh, an acting couple or something like that. It, it's 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 the story is about it's, a, it's about a man named uh, Walensky who went on to write uh, pop songs and hits for like Michael Jackson and um, uh, uh, Fifth Dimension and the people like that, you know. Um, uh, and uh, this this musical is basically a tribute to him by his brother who helped collaborate on some of the songs. But really was uh, somebody who helped. Frank, I'm, gonna helped be, I'm, I'm being given one minute. So I, oh, okay. I want to wrap this up, but I do want to talk about a couple of quick things with you. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, number one, about the, about the Irish rep. I think they've been really active, actually, during the pandemic. They have. Uh, because I see stuff on my Facebook page from them all the time. I worked with a guy named Derek Murphy. Do you know Derek? Oh, sure. Yeah, Derek's. Uh, yeah, uh, I believe they did one of his pieces this year. Well, his um, reading is going to be on the 21st on, on uh, uh, I'll, I'll send you something, but you, you can watch uh, free. He will too. And he Nick sends me stuff it. all the time. I did a, I did a reading of uh, one of his plays last year. But just to wrap this up, what are you, if you, if we do open up in September, are you going to do basically what was the end of last year's productions? Or I'm going to do, uh, I'll, I'll, yes, I'll do bunnies again uh, in the fall. And then I'm going to do a, uh, I've always wanted to work on O'Neill's. So I'm going to do two plays at once. Uh, Nick Harden is going to do Yui. And uh, on the main stage, I'm going to do uh, Desire Under the Elms, which is a play that oh. always interested me. Uh, and then I'm either going to do Ghosts by Ibsen. I'm sort of going through <laughs> these people. Um, I'm going to do Ghosts, uh, Lamford Wilson's translation. Or I will do uh, Martin, not Martin, Mc, uh, Connor McPherson wrote an adaptation of The Birds, oh, um, which is not the Hitchcocks, sure. uh, but it's based on the short story, you know. And um, I'm thinking of uh, maybe I'll do that. It, it, you know, I'm not sure yet. Next week we have on a, uh, a former actor, singer who is now becoming a rabbi, Jacqueline Grad. Thank you very much and tune in next week. <laughs>